So if you go to this website, the Ethnolog, you'll find out some information like there are about 7,000 languages. But for the purpose of this talk, what is important are the first two columns. If you look at the first one, what we have here is the number of speakers of a given language. So, for example, we find out that there are for between one to nine speakers, there are about 200 languages. And then we find out that between 10 and 99 speakers, there are about 344 languages. And then if you go to the very abundant language, the ones with a lot of speakers, between 100 million and about, uh, well, 1 billion or 1,000 million speakers, we find out that there are about eight languages. What is interesting here is that the, the most abundant number of languages, so, so to speak, are the ones with an intermediate number of speakers here. Okay, so the most abundant ones, which 1,967 languages, are the ones that have between 1,000 and 10,000 speakers. So what is also important to notice is that this scale here is basically a logarithmic scale. Now, if you plot these, you find out this kind of bell-shaped curve when we have in the x-axis the number of speakers of a given language and here the number of languages. Uh, this, for example, this paper comes from, this figure comes from a paper by Sutherland where he compares the parallel risks of global distribution of languages and species. The first thing, when I saw these, I was very excited when I, I thought I found something interesting. Then, of course, someone else has already done it. But that's always the case, it seems. But what I also asked was if the, what happens when you do the same thing as a function of countries. So if you choose countries with a large number of uh, languages, such as Papua New Guinea of Cameroon, what happens to that species, uh, language abundance distribution. And as you can see, they still have a bell-shaped distribution. So the question I asked was, what kind of model can I come up with that tries to describe or to describe this sort of uh, distribution? Now, I'm basically an ecologist or biologist, so I've been working on species diversity, and what is interesting as well is that this pattern also appears for species. So, for example, uh, this is Barro Colorado Island in Panama, and in 1982-83, uh, two ecologists, Steve Hubble and Robin Foster, established a 50-hectare plot here, where they measured all, measured and identified all the trees larger than one centimeter dbh. dbh means diameter at press height. So basically all the trees and shrubs which have a, a diameter larger than my finger were identified at species level. So they have about 300,000 individuals. And when they plotted the number of species as a function of the number of individuals in a logarithmic scale, they also come up with this sort of distribution. Now, Steve Hubble also tried to explain why they came up with this sort of distribution, and he used what he called the neutral theory. Now, the neutral theory has been very controversial in biology because the main assumption of neutral theory is that all individuals in the same trophic level, independently of the species, are equal. Now, this for biologists is a tremendous assumption, so they don't like it. And somehow I understand it. But I thought, well, maybe when it comes to human beings, it's much more reasonable to assume that independently of the language we speak, we are all the same, okay? So what I tried to do next was to, given that we have basically the same pattern in both cases, in species and in languages, why not try to use a neutral theory to explain this kind of uh, pattern we observe in languages, okay? When I say to explain, maybe some people will not say I'm trying to explain anything, but anyway, let's keep using the word explaining, okay? Now, let's think about this sort of caricature of the model I have in mind. Imagine a population that arrives in an island, and let's assume that there were no human beings before in the island. 
this population is going to grow and colonize the island. Let's assume that the process of colonizing the island is much faster than the process of giving origin to new languages, okay? So this population arrives to this island, colonizes the island, and once the island is fully occupied by human beings, so to speak, then language started diverging. So that is the model I have in mind. And now let's start using the ideas of neutral theory. So in neutral theory, let's assume this example where we have an island, and in this island we have two languages, the blue language and the red language. Now, let's assume that an individual dies. When an individual dies, we are going to ask the question. First, we are going to replace it. And the question we're going to ask is, does it come from a population already present, or a language already present, or does it going to start a completely new language? Okay? So, if the new individual belongs to an already existing population, we are going to choose the parent from one of the existing languages. In this case, obviously, it is more likely that we choose a blue language, a blue individual, but just because there are more. At the per capita level, they all have the same probability. But because the blue language is more abundant, it's more likely that they ended up choosing a blue language individual for father. And that means the new one will be a blue, a blue individual as well. So that's what I'm saying here. The probability is proportional just to the size of the several languages. On the other hand, if it happens that the new individual is going to start a new language, what we do, we just choose randomly one of the present languages and cut it, it with even a certain, cleave it, and choose a certain number of individuals to be the new individuals of the new language, okay? So that's the process. Now, there are a few more assumptions, and I'm using the work by Allen and Savage, and he has mainly four assumptions. And the first one is, the country is sufficiently large to be treated as an infinity for infinite for modeling purposes. And that's reasonable because most of the countries have millions of inhabitants, so that's all right. Now we are going to say that the rate of language creation, and sometimes I may say speciation, I'm just making a mistake, but I'm so used to say speciation, but that means really language creation, is equal to the language extinction. What it means is the number of languages is always constant on time, over time, okay? They, they don't change. Now, this was already said before, different languages have the similar per capita rate for language creation, okay? Per capita, so all individuals have the same probability of starting a new language, but of course, languages that are more abundant are more likely to give origin to new languages. And now comes a very, very important assumption that clearly does not apply to the human populations, but let's for a moment use it, which is to say the size of the population in a given country is more or less constant, okay? Well, we know that's not true for human beings, okay? But anyway, let's keep this assumption for a moment. Now, I'm not showing you the details, you have to believe me, but Alan Savage came up with a distribution function for this process I described it to you. The important thing about, uh, about this distribution here is that it has two parameters. One is theta, and this theta is proportional to the per capita rate, rate of speciation. I think the proper word is glossogenesis, but nobody uses it, and it's difficult to pronounce, at least to me, so I use speciation and that's proportional to the total size of the country's population, J sub M. The other very important parameter is P sub S, which is the proportion of individuals that will start a new language, okay? So these are two main parameters of this distribution. Now, I'm going to tell you already something, which is sometimes this fits the data very well, sometimes fits the data very badly. The question is, why does it fit well in some cases? Why does it fit so badly in other cases? So let me show you some examples where it fits very well. Solomon, Solomon Islands, for example, and it fits very well. So the red line is the Alan Savage distribution, the one I showed before, 
And the blue line is the log normal distribution, which kind of the competing distribution. And in this case, what you can see is that the Allen Savage fits the data much better than the log normal distribution. So just in case, let me repeat you, let me repeat. Here you have the number of speakers in the logarithmic scale, and here you have the number, number of languages, okay? If you look at Papua New Guinea, for example, you also have a very good fit. Both log normal and the Allen Savage distribution give a very good fit, but in fact, the Allen Savage is slightly better, okay? If you look at the Cameroon, we get the same thing. Again, the Allen Savage fits the data very well, uh, better than the log normal. And I could keep showing you African countries where the fit is always very, very good. So for Africa, for reasons that I haven't understood completely, the Allen Savage distribution fits the data very well. If you try to fit data from Indonesia, for example, you really have a bad result. The fit is really bad. So this is a log normal distribution, and here you have the Allen Savage distribution. And as you can see, there is this very strange plateau in the Allen Savage distribution that clearly does not fit the data. Now, I could also show you the data for Malaysia, I could show you the data for the Philippines, and you will see that the fit is also very bad. So, what is interesting here is that the Allen Savage distribution fits the data very well for Africa and fits the data very badly for Asia. Why? Let's try to see why. I'm not completely sure, but anyway, let's see our assumptions. Now, there are two assumptions that are, one is clearly wrong, and this is one. Uh, the population is kept at a constant size. And we know that is not true because we know that human population has been growing very, very fast in the last couple of hundreds, year, hundreds of years. But the other one, it's a little bit more tricky, is neutral growth. I've been assuming that all individuals are equal. And maybe we are not all equal. And this is not a racist statement. It has a very specific meaning, as I'll explain later on, okay? But so, I believe the reason why the Allen Savage distribution does not fit the, the data for the Asian countries very well is because of these two assumptions. So the first one, as I told you, is the problem of the population size. And as you can see, here you have time, here's the present, well, in fact, 2025, but it doesn't matter, right? But here's the present, <laughs> that's the past, here's the size of the human population. As you can see, we, are being growing, we, are, we have been growing very, very fast in the last couple of hundred years. Now, so the first thing I'm trying to do now is let's assume for a moment that the, given a country, the populations can grow, they all grow with the same growth rate, but they all grow with the same growth rate, that's the point. So if you do that, let's take, for example, the Cameroons, and let's say that was how it used to be 100 years ago, and now let's assume that the population starts growing, all the population starts growing with a given growth rate, exponential growth rate, okay? And what you can see is that the distribution does not change the shape when you go over time. So this is a couple of hundred years, couple of years later, and then here is some time later, and some time later. And the distribution does not change at all the shape. What happens is just the, sh the, the distribution shifts to the right. If you try to fit this distribution, these ones here, these three ones, with the Allen Savage distribution, it still fits very well. Because here, the only thing we did was to, to, to shift the distribution to the right. So nothing changed. So let's go back to the, the other one, the other assumption, which is that all individuals are equal in their probability of dying, reproducing, and speciating. Now, it's not clear for me what's going on here, and that is a good question, I believe, for sociobiologists. But what I'm going to assume is that we have a country like Cameroon, and then again, we are going to assume that all the populations are going to start, start growing at a given time, but some languages are growing, are growing faster than others, okay? They all grow, but they are not going to grow with the same growth rate. Some will grow faster, okay? Now, if that happens, this is what you have. We start with, this is Cameroon again. So this is the original distribution. And as you can see, you have a very good fit here. And then when these populations start growing, and oh, I forgot to tell you something. 
And I'm going to assume that the most abundant languages, the ones that here are the ones with the largest number of individuals, are going to be the ones that are going to grow faster. So there is some sort of mechanism that, let's say, if you, if you speak a language that is only spoken by a small group of people, and if there is a language that is spoken by a lot of people, then maybe you prefer your children to start speaking the language of the large majority of people. So there's a, a voluntary, or maybe sometimes not so voluntary, shift to the largest language. So what I'm going to assume is that the most abundant language grow faster. So they all grow, and that may not be a very, a very realistic case, assuming that they all grow, but let's assume that they all grow, and the abundant ones will grow faster. So if that happens, what you can start see, what you can see here, is that when you try to fit the distribution for, uh, at later times, you start having a plateau developing here. Okay? So this is very conjectural, but what I'm saying is the reason why for the Asian countries, the, 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 Alan, the Alan Savage distribution does not fit the data very well, is because you have languages that are growing at different rates. So that's one possible explanation. And I'd like to know what sociolinguists think about it, okay? So very briefly, some conclusions. Oops. So you already know about this because uh, Mark Pagel mentioned that. So there are several similarities between the geographical distribution of language and species richness. Uh, language abundance distributions have a bell-shaped distribution, as I showed you, for most countries. I can also tell you that the only two countries where I didn't find this bell-shaped distribution were the United States and Australia. And instead, what you have for those is basically a monotonically decreasing function. So that means we have a lot of language with just one and two individuals. And I think what happens there is that a lot of languages are losing, are disappearing, are becoming extinct. And maybe that process already occurred in other countries, like Brazil, for example, but it's still going on in Australia and in the United States in a very clear way. So, some language abundance distribution conform to the tenets of the neutral theory, and that seems to be the, the African countries. And maybe what's going on for the African countries is that it's not so clear that some languages are growing much faster than others. Why? I don't know. And others exhibit characteristics that can be attributed to non-neutral processes, okay? We, and these, um, these ones are the Asian languages. So what I suspect may be happening, for example, is education is playing a very important role and enforcing people to shift from one language to another. And maybe if you, if you look at data on the Asian countries, you can see that the level of education or the way that the states tend to reach people and try to have everybody having some sort of education is, is far more relevant than you find for African countries. So maybe in African countries you still have a lot of tribes speaking their own local language and they are still growing and they are not shifting to other ones, at least not as fast as in Asia. Although I predict, so that's a prediction of this, my model, is that maybe in a couple of years the African countries will start exhibiting a pattern similar to the one that you now see for Asian countries. And so I'd like to acknowledge these people and I also I'd like to acknowledge everyone. Thank you very much.